really a journey map should be like the x-ray of your customer experience. So it should be that very tangible, visible proof of what is actually going on in your organization, uncovering gaps, uncovering opportunities, just as your doctor would look out for any, any injuries or whatever on, a, on an x-ray. But it should really be a representation. It shouldn't just be aspirational future state or some sort of vision. Yes, it's nice to have that and it's nice to put your goals in there, but really it should be a representation of what is actually happening. And it's such a pleasure to be here and actually to be back again. I think this is our, our second time speaking together. Um, we're super excited to talk about actionable strategies uh, for d- delivering customer centricity and using your journey map as a way to do that. So our mission today is really to help you all uh, by bringing some experience that we have, again, in the B2B space. Uh, We usually work mostly with SaaS, um, I would say SaaS, PaaS, CPaaS, CPaaS, lots of different types of um, uh, of subscription-based companies. But ultimately, a a lot of the strategies and the action items that we'll share today, the the actual tactics, are things that you could use, I think, across any organization. Um, So we're big believers in that. I'll talk a little bit about that. But today, we're going to transform, hopefully show you a few tips and tricks to transform your customer journey map into actionable strategies that foster customer centricity along all of the steps of the journey and exploring those key steps to take your map to the next level. So we're excited to be here today. Thanks for your time. Uh, You know us now. (laughs) Uh, My name is Amy Downs, founder of Customer Obsessing Consulting, uh, and I am based out of Hamburg. I've, uh, as mentioned, I've held held global roles for many, many um, years, Uh, have been in the tech space for about 23 years. uh, And yeah, very, um, very, 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 very into uh, all things uh, customer obsession, obsession uh, on the post sales side of the journey, um, but also have led uh, led teams on the sales side as well. And so, I'm a big believer in using journey mapping to influence and drive uh, change in organizations, really positive change, and kind of bringing teams together. So excited to share some of that. Sally, did you want to do a quick? Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, well, I'm Sally. I am one of the co-founders of uh, Customer Obsessive Consulting. I'm based in Berlin, uh, but have been around uh, Europe for a bit as well. Um, I, I used to be on Amy's team, actually. This is how uh, we found each other. And her drive for customer centricity would always was impressed me so much. So I'm excited that we are on this journey together. And I bring my, as I said already before, my project management background. Uh, so I'm all about documentation, all about the mapping. So I'm super excited to be speaking today. Thanks, Sally. And our mission at Customer Obsessing is to bring customer obsession to every organization in the world. We use journey mapping as a tool to do that. Um, we've got a, a great proven framework that we use in B2B companies um, to really help foster this, um, this vision of customer centricity. Um, and we do that by empowering organizations to maximize the value that they bring by connecting everybody and the idea of customer centricity. So we're going to share how journey mapping plays into that, our vision and mission um, as a consultancy. Exactly. Uh, and with that, we come to a bit of an agenda. Uh, Amy touched on, I think, most of the points already. Look into how you go from mapping to strategy, uh, how you foster buy-in. So everything that was in the chats, definitely we'll touch on that. Um, we want to look into how you transform your map actually into concrete steps. So what do you actually do with it? You like hanging it on a nice poster in your offices. And we share a few of our best practices and then we'll come to the Q&A, obviously. But before going there, we want to make a distinction that might be new to some of you. I don't know. It was fairly new to me because I come from the post sales space. So I have never been in the marketing or say inside of the house. And when we first started working with maps, we found that generally people think about a journey map as in terms of a buyer's map, which is not the full picture for us. So we thought we'd start here with a little clarification of what we mean. Uh, generally, when we think about a buyer's journey or a journey in general, we speak about B2B customers that we work with or, cons- or, or we consult companies that are in the B2B space. And our understanding really goes beyond just the buyer's map. And I don't want to offend any marketers here, but uh, we found that usually people are very diligent in mapping their marketing funnel, all the buying stages from awareness to the consideration, and then obviously buying something. 
But then usually the mapping stops somehow, or at least get it to, it gets really vague. And then there's one bucket that says adoption or being live. And then it's like end of the life cycle, which is actually a, a bit surprising to me because I obviously am of the strong belief that we want our customers to be in the buying stage for as short as we can, get them on board as quickly as we can. And I keep them as a customer for as long as we can. So we should be focusing on this long period of time. And this is why we focus on the post-sales journey, mainly in our consulting work. We typically see a big knowledge gap when it comes to your post-sales map, because oftentimes, yeah, the knowledge around the strong documentation sits within the pre-sales area. Uh, and we want to expand that. So we want to take the learnings from there, all about being diligent and mapping those things and enriching it with all the actual data that we have in post-sales, because that's the beauty uh, that we have in post-sales, that we are already in contact with our customers. And if we actually look into this perspective a bit more on looking from the post-sale perspective into the mapping topic, there's a few advantages that we see and that we are proud, uh, proud to leverage with our customers. First and foremost, in post-sales, we already know our customers pretty well. So in marketing, it's oftentimes the best guess or it's a market research topic that we try to understand how a journey could look like. But the nice thing about post-sales is we are already in contact with our customers. We are already with them. Uh, so it is even, even better to look into how the actual experience is and improve this actual already happening experience. Secondly, post-sales teams know your customers best. So you have real insight into what the actual personas are that you're working with. We come to the topic that Veronica stretched out before different personas in the map in a second. Um, but really the nice thing is once your customer is on board in production, either in adoption or expansion, we have a really good feeling for the personas that we're working with. So our map gets even more real life. It has all the actual customer data in it that we use day to day. And then last but not least, your frontline services staff or customer success managers are probably the ones closest to your customers for most of the time. If you compare the time that a salesperson spends in one-on-one -on -one conversations with a with the prospect to the time that a CSM or a support person or an adoption manager will spend with them after they sign, this time span is usually way longer. So we have a really good hold and touch on what this customer feels and needs. So we see those folks as like the spiders in the web that have their, their legs and a bit of everything. So they know your customer really well. They know your internals really well. So all of this wealth is held by them and can be put into your journal map. Thanks for that, Sally. And as we think about, you know, one of the biggest things that we hear from clients that we work with, um, and and I think what we what we heard uh, in the early part of uh, through the chat of uh, some of the challenges uh, and I guess opportunities that that this group has um, is really getting buy-in and sort of fostering adoption. Uh, and making the maps operational. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, about that. We one of the the big things um, that that mapping helps us with as we work with customers is breaking down the silos. And I think this is such a huge opportunity for all of those on the call that are looking to to make the maps actionable. Um, the one of the biggest areas that we see is is basically mapping and, and sort of understanding what that customer voice is that's coming into the business. So as we think about the different inputs that we're using, um, we like to use the voice of the customer. We talk a little bit about that um, and the sort of tail end because if you if you take the map as a as a purview of like I always say looking looking at things through the customer lens and. Again, as you're as you're trying to influence across the organization um, and get other stakeholders to sort of buy in and to and to support it, um, if you look at this through the customer lens, which is really what journey mapping is all about, understanding the experience, understanding those personas, um, this is a really great opportunity for us to sort of bring that that outside perspective in. So one of the things that we use is net promoter or voice lots of, and, and that's one of many mechanisms, uh, but a lot of voice of the customer data. And we try to feed that into the journey map alongside some of the different input um, 
from different departments. And what that actually allows us to do is to sort of take the, I think in many companies, you sort of have like, oh, this department's doing this and this department's doing that. And there's there's a lot of like, you own this or you own that. So rather than rather than approaching it from a hey let's let's own this together as as a cross functional team so that we can build an experience that's really great for customers and sort of again taking out the I think sometimes uh, the finger pointing that happens between departments and really unifying and uniting the departments by using the vehicle of the voice of the customer feeding that voice into the journey map and then sharing these are the sort of the, the the points in the journey um, and, and again, and the points in the customer's experience um, that are really challenging or that we have areas for opportunities or that like actually are going really, really well that we want to double down on. And you start changing the vernacular in your organization to really be around the voice of the customer, the customer lens um, and, and unifying these different cross-functional areas. Um, and I think keeping that, um, uh, you know, this map and sort of a, a centralized um, area also helps with that. So those are just some of the pointers that, um, uh, that we'd like to to share with you that have worked uh, as we implement this with multiple of our clients and and I, and I have implemented that as an operator uh, many many times over. I find that's the most successful thing to do to influence the organization. And again, this is a living and breathing thing. So there's kind of the cyclical loop. Uh, this this kind of goes to that third point of making it operational, making it a continuous exercise. As you get new, uh, as you're surveying or getting new voice of the customer in you know, there's kind of this continuous updating of the map. Um, yeah. So back to you. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I'm big on like images and, and storytelling. So for me, really what helps make it tangible is that we see journey mapping as a catalyst for customer centricity in many different regards. Um, two of those images being that really a journey map should be like the X-ray of your customer experience. So it should be that very tangible, visible proof for what is actually going on in your organization, uncovering gaps, uncovering opportunities, just as your doctor would look out for any any injuries or whatever on, a, on an x-ray. But it should really be a representation. It shouldn't just be the aspirational future state or some sort of vision. Yes, it's nice to have that and it's nice to put your goals in there, but really it should be a representation of what is actually happening. And also in the spirit of this image, this the journey map helps you to spotlight uh, silent saboteurs. And oftentimes, and that's actually funny enough, it's not what we think at a first glance is what our customers are annoyed at, uh, annoyed by. So there's a lot of things that they could be tripping over, that they could be needing, that we would have no idea about. So what drives customer satisfaction and loyalty might be a bit in the in the dark for you all, uh, at least that we find for a lot of customers. And by mapping it and really incorporating the voice of the customer that AD referred to helps you spotlight those things. And it could be such simple thing, things as like your billing process or the ease of using something. We never know. And it's always the most obvious thing to say, ask your customer. Uh, but then not every, everybody does it eventually. Um, but let's get even a bit more practical because uh, Veronica shared earlier already that there's the possibility in the UX Boxer maps to have different personas. And we want to reiterate that point. Um, we always start with the topic of segmentation when we go into a new customer case. And segmentation is all about looking into your customer base and trying to understand it really well. And to then look into what does each category within our customer base actually need and want. And the first objection always is, we want to serve everybody. Everybody deserves the same attention. And yes, that is actually true, but not everybody needs to get it in the same vehicle, if you like. Not everybody needs to get it in the same type of communication style. Maybe even your customers appreciate some automation, self-service, things like that. It's not at all about prioritizing anyone. It's about tailoring the messaging around the right segments. And it's not just a message but it's also the right audience and the right time. So where can we be closest to our customers? When's the best time to interact with them? Because it might be very diff uh, different if you're a user of a product, for example, if you are uh, in an operating role, or maybe you're a reseller or partner role. So then we have to treat you completely differently. So that should be different segments. Also, you want to tailor the product or service offering to their specific needs and pain points. A small customer might be very different from an enterprise customer. 
You might offer the enterprise one a services package at a high price that they need and like. The small one would never have an appetite for that. And then lastly, we want to personalize the communication and marketing efforts, depending on the different segments in order to increase engagement. And we can segment by different things, revenue size and probably number of licenses of products. That is what most people use. And it's a super fair point to start. We also see great success in doing uh, segmentation regionally. We are based in Germany. We know of the specialities here in the region. A French customer, a Spanish one, an American one, and a Japanese one might be very different. So it's very well worthy if you have the capacity to go into regional segmentation. And then lastly, also the industry is interesting. So for example, um, if you have different customer groups, some are all in the, um, in the, I don't know, now I can't come up with industries. So the health sector, for example, or all of them are in the educational space. Whatever it might be, they might have very different needs. So segmentation is a starting point for your journey mapping. And then beyond segments, you also have different personas. Again, in within a customer, there could be all different types of people that are involved, stakeholders. You have a user, probably someone that administers your software, someone that bought it, someone that is championing it, someone that is onboarding it, so many different stakeholders. And they have different journeys within your product. So it's either worth having multiple journeys if that's a fit for you, or break it down within the journey to have different persona descriptions and different journeys on them. And once we do that, and we want to drill it a level deeper, going into the operation operationalization part of it, that's always the hardest word, um, we want to turn the journey map as it stands into something more practical. As you probably have all seen, a customer comes on through sales, they're onboarded somewhere, they go into adoption, maybe you upsell them and then they renew. That's like the, the high level titles, at least, of a, of, of a customer journey. We like to extend this in our journey mapping exercises by the journey phase owners. So who's actually responsible for these things? We start off in sales, then we have the marketing team doing all the, all the prep, all the legwork before sales comes in and they let their business, business drive come in drive negotiations, close a deal, get that signature. Before we then go into onboarding, depending on the maturity of your organization, maybe you have an onboarding team, an enablement team, a training team, whatever that might be. And then if we go further on in adoption and expansion, that's usually where a customer success team takes over or services team or expansion team or whatever it's called at your organization, but some sort of post-sales team. And then in the renewal stage, you might bring on an account manager again. That could also be the same person that was in the sales play before, could be a different person. As many SaaS companies as there are, the many setups there are. So this is not set in stone, but the idea is to define it for your organization, who owns which phase. And then the maximum practicality comes into play when we look into designing functional plays within each of these phases. So let's just take the example of the onboarding team here. Your customers in onboarding, they sign what happens then. We own them in the onboarding team or enablement team. We probably have some sort of kickoff with that customer, setting out expectations, defining where they want to go with the product. We have a technical setup. Maybe there's even a solution architect coming into play. We have user enablement. Maybe there's an academy. Maybe they go through training. Maybe you have on-site visits to get your product up and running all of these things. And then also we have feature adoption. Is everybody in a company able to use their licenses? Are all accounts properly set up? Depending on your product, these might be plays that you have to go through in that journey stage. And for us, really the big thing is nailing all of these in process design. And that's just where my project management heart comes through. The more detailed, the better. You could even break out any of these steps into its own little journey, if that's helpful. Over-documentation is also not good. But document it somewhere in some form that you have it clearly set out. What do we do here? What's the outcome we want to produce? And who's responsible for it? And then if we tr drill a level deeper, I want to look at how this could be practically looking like. So what we like to do with our customers is create team charters for each team along the customer journey. And this is a document that holds all the all the information about this team, their mission, why they're here, their role, their responsibilities, their metrics, their tools, 
all of these type of things. And the core of what we want to extract from this are three things. Their input factors, what do they need? Their output factors, what do they produce for the others? And how are we measured? So for a sales team, for example, the inputs that they get is, for example, the number of leads, the lead quality that you're getting, or campaign engagement that you get from marketing. So all of this good material that you can go off work with and get a good com- uh, relationship with the customer. The output that they create is the average deal size, it's the sales cycle length, it's the discovery notes, it's everything that's usually stored in your CRM. And how do we measure success? Obviously, by revenue. That is pretty straightforward in sales. Uh, their sales quota attainments, their cost of acquisition, and the list could go on and on. But they, are, they don't exist isolated in the silo that Amy described earlier. They are interconnected with the others. So the next following team would be the onboarding team. And they get all of the good stuff that sales predate, and they do their own thing with it. So their input factors, again, are all of the new customers that come on board, the C-set, CSET scores that they have after the sales process, the value drivers that they define during the sales stage. All of this comes into input for onboarding. And they, again, create output for the following teams. So this would be time to first value, the number of support tickets they needed, training engagement, you name it, all the customer data collected. And then again, their success is measured in a certain type of way. Could be the retention rates, could be the time to value, could be the NPS, all of these things. It gets a bit tougher to measure it actually uh, um, objectively as far as we go down the, the uh, journey route. But still, try to make it as tangible and measurable as possible. And here you already see how your journey map ties in with stuff like your performance review, your process designs, your evalu- evaluation of someone's potential, because all these things are lift exercises and are day-to-day things that people interact with. So it's not something, again, on a, on a post on the wall, but it's practically what they do day-to-day. Thanks for that, Sally. Yeah, and I think that's it. I love your last point because I do feel like a lot of times we talk, we, we talk about the journey mapping in this external perspective. But ultimately, the way to drive the behavior within organizations is to use the journey map as the catalyst to basically have those output metrics that we saw a bit earlier when we saw the the journey map example um, and drive that into the individual team members' KPIs. And and it's really, that's where the, I think the rubber meets the road and how you can, how you actually drive the behavior um, of, yeah, of, of, uh, of, of success. So um, really, really great point. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And, and also for the lead in. Uh, so coming back to this cycle of feedback and action, um, as we talked about earlier, the input for the journey map is really like what's coming in from uh, the voice of, of our customers. It's one of those input mechanisms that Sally talked about before, and you saw the example of uh, CSAT, for example, uh, or it's maybe a, some, some type of touchpoint experience survey that's happening along each of those journey phases. Um, and what's really important is that this the the voice of the customer that's kind of going into the journey map is is also being consistently used as we're building that journey map across the different phases. Um, and so there's actually this holistic approach. And we, we talked a little bit earlier, I had mentioned a little bit earlier about um, voice of the customer and, and net promoter surveys, but actually voice of the customer is much, much more than just the surveying mechanism. Um, and so I wanted to explain a little bit about how we think about voice of the customer. This again is another, um, framework that we, we help our customers implement day in and day out. Um, but ultimately it's, it's capturing what customers are saying about your brand across multiple different channels and segments, um, and gives it, gives insights into customer preferences, the value drivers, where are their opportunities for improvement within the organization, um, leverages technology. So for example, surveys, social media monitoring, enterprise feedback management, um, speech and web analytics. So there's a lot of different mechanisms, support tickets, um, all sorts of live chat. Uh, we, we bring that in a lot of times. So there's a lot of these different input vehicles that are sort of making up this, this full voice. And of course, there's a lot of data mining that you can do against those, um, uh, all of those different, uh, uh, sentiment, 
uh, points um, to really to really understand what each persona is thinking. Um, and you can look at that by segment, et cetera. Um, and ultimately responding to the to their feedback and delivering this in, through that journey mapping mechanism and using it as input uh, and also as as output really improves customer satisfaction and loyalty. And that's the the end game. Um, and obviously, we all know loyal customers uh, deliver better revenue results for companies um, and ultimately make employees a lot happier too. So it's a win win situation. Uh, so lots of, lots of greater share of wallet, obviously, and what we call an increase in second order revenue, which is really those word of mouth referrals. And we heard Sally talk a little bit earlier about the cost to acquire customers, those word of mouth referrals are, are pretty much free marketing. So, um, so there's the second order revenue magnitude magnifier that voice of the customer has. And so we, we find this is a really important and critical piece that, that leads into the journey mapping exercise and should be carried out throughout. Um, for those of you who don't, or, or maybe don't have a voice of the customer program, um, within your organization today, one aspect of that that we use and uh, we find a lot of companies use uh, these days is um, is net promoter surveys. And so if you, as you think about this from a journey mapping perspective, um, there are two two types of surveys that um, kind of holistically that, that that we talk about. One is a relationship survey. Um, and this is really like a bigger picture view of the overall holistic relationship that you have with your customer. So it's not necessarily at a particular touch point in the journey, but actually like, how are you doing overall with that relationship? And so this is related to brand. It's related to sort of their, their sales experience or experience with onboarding, their experience with your finance team, uh, for example. And so it's looking at you kind of across the product, across all of the services that you offer, and is more of that holistic picture of their overall experience. Whereas the transactional survey is a survey that's actually happening sort of across each of these journey phases and is a really great opportunity as you're building your journey map, use those transactional surveys at these different journey uh, you could either use them at hand handover points, which is something that uh, that we typically see. So after the sales cycle, after an onboarding or after a professional services um, event, uh, after, uh, during adoption. So maybe after a, a, an ops review or after strategic business review. But this helps you to not only get an understanding of like, how are you doing at that phase of the journey, but also how are the team members doing? And it gives you again, this sort of external and internal view. How are you doing with your customers and how are your internal team members doing like individually so that you can go back and do coaching and measuring? Um, and so we, we tend to, um, uh, well, we actually always recommend to our clients that uh, that those transactional surveys are a part of that journey mapping um, uh, process. And we use that that as an input and an output throughout those journey phases and throughout the life cycle. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to just share very quickly around the um, the power of the voice of the customer is um, promoters and detractors. So net promoter uh, it kind of separates uh separates customers into three distinct buckets. Promoters, which are customers who are very likely to recommend your brand. Um, passives, which are sort of customers that um, uh, they don't, they maybe don't love you. They maybe don't hate you. They're probably somewhere in between. Um, and then detractors. And these are, these are folks, uh, customers that really, uh, there's some sort of issue going on that you really want to look at. And so the, really the power in the net promoter system is the idea is to create more promoters and fewer detractors and, and wrapping that into the business. Um, and so just some metrics for you all as you're thinking about how do you influence, you know, maybe how do you, how do you bring this voice of the customer into your journey map, into your organization? Uh, we, we just put some broad spectrum metrics here. Um, for you all to, to perhaps take back to your own organizations. But organizations that have a VOC program in place experience 55% higher customer retention. Um, and we'll share these slides with you all so you've got an idea and you can speak to some of these notes. We've got some really good reference points, um, for example, from Bain and other um, uh, other companies in here. And the median retention rate is 8.5% higher in B2B um, of companies who actually close the loop. So this is taking that customer feedback, actioning it, or even not actioning it if you decide not to action it as a company, but at least closing the loop with the customer to let them know you've been heard and we're taking some sort of action based on your feedback. Um, and then sending multiple surveys a year, for those of you who are sending surveys or thinking about it, um, to multiple stakeholders can actually double your retention rate. So this goes a little bit back to what Sally said. When you're journey mapping, 
um, you know, really you have to break it down. You have to break it down because it's not, uh, I would say one size does not fit all. It's not like a, a, a hat or a, or a nice, uh, a nice scarf. Um, customers are very different. So, so making sure you've got this great segmentation strategy, you understand what those different personas are, um, and you're you're actually kind of working towards making sure that each of those is taken care of and listening to that voice. Um, those are really really important. And so, kind of getting that broad spectrum voice uh, across those different segments and across those different personas and stakeholders is really important part of your your overall program and listening to that that voice. Thanks, Sally. Of course, to wrap it up, that, yeah, yeah. give the super tip, the secret sauces. <laughs> no, just kidding. No, no, it's way too high expectations. But all the best practices that we want to share. I mean, you want to take the first one because you kicked us off with that topic. Absolutely, absolutely. Beginning. You got it. You got it. Um, I build bridges, not silos. So, um, having been a uh, post sale leader for for over twenty years, I think this is probably one of your one of the biggest recipes for success is making sure that. You're using the journey map as a facilitation mechanism to really bring your company together. And what that means is bringing different departments together, bringing all of the different people along and making them part of creating the journey. Um, so if you are a CX professional, uh, a recommendation that, that we would have for you is, is to maybe host workshops internally and start to bring together these cross-functional teams. A lot of times if you're starting, um, we would recommend that you sort of start if you're, you know, doing the, the, not the buyer's journey, but the customer journey, um, that you start with the post sales teams because they are so close to the customer and they kind of know what's going on. And then you can start to sort of branch out from there, branch back into sales and branch over into support. Um, so we always recommend maybe starting with the teams that if you've got a customer success team or an onboarding implementation team, um, starting with those teams first uh, and then kind of branching out and bringing these other cross-functional departments together. Sally. Exactly. Segment strategically, uh, that goes back to the point that not one size fits all for obvious reasons. Um, it can be helpful, and we had that question actually in the chat, to create different journeys for different customer segments by industry, size, or even persona. Um, I'd really say it depends on your maturity and how complex your customer base is, whether you want to do this or not. Uh, I wouldn't start with the broadest of, of all ideas because what we tend to see is that people are so uh, occupied with the perfect picture of a journey map in the beginning that you really struggle to get started. So start with a big one, a general one, and then refine it over time and make it adjusted for industries, again, for personas. And if you then end up having multiple versions, fantastic, as long as it works for your teams. So I would always consider how usable is the output, but in any place, segment wisely. So you have as good of a representation of the individual segments as possible in your mapping. Great tip. And um, ultimately, make, making your data sing. We are big believers in using data to to drive all of the decisions um, as we as we think about journey. And it's a big it's a big deal. There's a lot of data that goes into um, into it. So just making sure that you're connecting your 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 uh, journey map to that voice of the customer data super super important. Um, and making sure that that is is informing the map and vice versa. And actually not this type of data. We have a question in the chat as well about uh, success metrics and how we, docu we we would document. And so, for example, matching your confluence with your journey map. In our space where we are on post-it, we often type for CRMs or a CS platform or Jira tickets. Uh, we definitely advise you to bring this data over into your journey map. It doesn't have to be super elaborate that it's like always, uh, always, um, we say that, but whenever you look at the journey map, it should have up-to-date data. So we usually don't see that teams purely live in their journey map and see all the dashboards in there. But whenever we, you look at something through a customer lens, through your journey map, then the data should be represented. Maybe it's the top three for each page or it's the most determining ones. Um, that, could be, that could be different things, but definitely have it represented in the map, I would add here. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Sally. And I think this goes back to that point three, that continuous exercise. Yep. I mean, the, the data is changing, your, your segments will change, your company will grow, 
you know, mm-hmm. so your so your map is just continuously evol- evolving um, based on what the data is telling you. So so I think that's such a powerful, like yeah, just just a very powerful um, uh, tip. Um, empower everyone. So uh, this is this is uh, I think also such a such a great point. Um, we are big believers in making like uh, what what I would say. Um, uh, don't leave the map just up to the experts. So get more people involved, making sure that you've, you're equipping your individual contributors with the playbooks that they need based on the journey map to guide those daily interactions. And this is where, this is sort of, Sally had talked about this earlier, but this is making it actionable and usable because ultimately you could build a great journey map, but if nobody's using it, <laughs> And your company's not getting value out of it. Like, why build it in the first place? So, so the idea would be, you know, start small. Make sure that you've got, you know, some maybe some really like your. I would say that use an eighty twenty rule. So, so take the plays that you're the playbooks that you are um, implementing most frequently within your organization. Make sure that you map those out. Get the metrics again. Make sure you've got those metrics that you know how are you driving the behavior of the individual contributor, um, and and measuring them on success and continuously kind of evolving that journey map. So empower the entire organization. This is where that again, you know, workshop formats, getting the getting the teams involved um, are really really helpful. Totally. And then in the very best case scenario, if people attend those workshops and engage with your map. You want to create CX ambassadors, and you could call that whatever, that's just our term for it, but really find advocates within each of the function areas. So within marketing, within finance, within product, uh, within support, whatever it might be, find those champions for your cause that are obsessed with your customers, that are interested in driving this initiative, um, and bring them along for the journey mapping and also to keep the topic top of mind within their teams. Because I've seen another question in the chat that speaks to everybody's kind of keen to do mapping initiatives, but the maintenance is the tough bit. And we really think that it comes down to ownership and it comes down to assigning responsibility through something like the ambassadors. Uh, We usually are confronted with someone in the room whenever we pitch this that says, we are all in the game of customer centricity. It's everybody's responsibility to use the map, be in the map. But if something is everybody's responsibility, it's just no one. It's no one's responsibility. So if we don't have clear, clear owners and clear drivers, it's really tough. And that would probably be my answer to this maintenance question: is leverage those folks that you know are passionate. Look for those people that want to drive, that want to go the extra mile for a customer, and make them your representatives within their teams because they also know their language best, so they will have an easier time explaining the value to them than you might have. Yeah, Sally, that's such a great point. And yeah, and I was just gonna just gonna add one little nugget on top of that. Um, because ultimately, if you do have these CX ambassadors, they can also be sort of the voice of the customer within their own department. And sometimes that voice sure. is not brought, like it isn't isn't fully brought in. So um, so, so I think that's just another additive that it, it keeps each of those functional silos really connected and what's going on with the sentiment of the customer. So huge um uh, huge tip. And then yeah, lastly, but last but not least, be dynamic, um, not static. Uh, you know, this is um, keep keep your journey map fresh as the data, as we mentioned earlier, and just kind of, you know, honing in on that point, as things are changing within the organization, as your customer base is changing, as new products are being added, um, as you're finding new sort of stakeholders within your customer base um, or, or new ways to, um, to that they're using the product. Um, there's all sorts of, of different ways that the journey map continues to morph and to grow. And as your organization grows, you know, your departments will change and, um, and teams will change. So it's, it's a living, breathing document that needs to sort of be a living, breathing document within the organization. So anything that you can do to set up cadences with those CX ambassadors to make sure that you've got some sort of rhythm, maybe that's a quarterly rhythm around figuring out like, how are you maintaining and, and updating it? Um, sync the rhythms probably to your VOC program to make sure that you've got that voice of the customer coming in and you're making and adapting changes based on that. That's our last tip. <laughs> so with that, uh, question time. Yes. I was waiting for you to show the last slide. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thanks, <Monica. Yeah. laughs> Well, if you wouldn't, uh, if you didn't, I would encourage you to do so. But uh, well, thank you for showing the slides. Thank you so much, ladies, for your presentation, for sharing actually uh, exact steps people can take uh, to, to take actions. And I really loved how you incorporated the questions from the chat into, uh, you know, uh, the previous slide that you were talking about. I know that's not, not all. I was, uh, you know, taking notes. Uh, there was such a pleasure. Uh, we will have a Q and A anyway. We still have about like five questions probably in the chat. And uh, those of you who have more questions, now is the time for you to uh, to send them to the chat. And meanwhile, while you are doing that, I would like to tell you something. So uh, as you know, uh, Amy and Sally uh, shared uh, what steps you can take to uh, uh, to make your journey maps actionable. But I want to bring back the topic that uh, to do so, you first need to have a journey map. And uh, if you're looking for a uh, professional and easy to use tool to uh, create journey maps, your expression is right here for you. All you need to do is uh, to book a free 15-minute call with our team to learn more about your expression. And if you already build your maps in some other tools and you know, the whole idea of uh, taking your, uh, exporting your map from the tool and importing it into your expression, transferring everything without losing any data uh, is overwhelming and scary and we don't want to do that. Uh, no worries, our team will be ready to help you to do that uh, quickly and smoothly. And now, without further, further ado, uh, let's uh, get back to the questions. Uh, we have some of them and I believe there are some more in the chat. Uh, so uh, Rick was asking uh, uh, about the segmentation based on uh, jobs to be done. Uh, do you yeah. want to add anything? I, I could answer that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we actually, uh, this is, I, I think, a I, I remember this HBR article from uh, from a while back. But what what we do when we look at we we actually um, do decomposition of like team based uh, roles and responsibilities. And the way that we look at that is is through this sort of jobs to be done lens. Um, so absolutely, there could be an opportunity to look at like how do you actually segment and and treat a customer based on those jobs to be done. I think what you have to sort of be careful about is the sequence. <laughs> um, so making sure that you, you know, in it, right now we've got sort of these, what we typically do with clients is, um, is map out the journey phases, but with the jobs to be done model, perhaps you just need to, to make sure that there's some really tight sequencing that happens um, between those jobs that are done for customers and that you, yeah, but, but I think that's, that's certainly um, one opportunity or, or a different way to think about the segmentation. Sally, did you, did you have anything to add, add to that one? No, totally. I we are all for uh, for specializations and for looking at the jobs to be done, making subject matter experts shine. Uh, I think what is really important from a project perspective or just from a communication perspective in general is the handovers between those jobs because they kind of all happen in a mm -hmm. in some sort of historic, uh, um, yeah, um, uh, following. Uh, and we want all the data to be taken from one job to the other. We don't want the next person in line to do a job to go back to square zero with the customer. So I, I'm all about the handovers, the documentation. And if you nail that, I'm all for it. Thank you. Uh, I was looking through the questions in the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, another question that we have uh, is, well, kind of a long one. Uh, product teams uh, aim to create uh, customer journey maps and commit to taking action and focusing on future uh, CJMs. However, due to constantly changing product prior priorities, they may struggle to sustain momentum after completing the current journey map. This can result in a lack of motivation. Do you have any suggestions to prevent it? Should I? Yes, <laughs> go for it. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> um, I think for me, it comes back to tying it to the outcome of what we're producing. I mean, we're not putting tasks out there and we're not making people responsible of certain parts of the, of the, of the journey map just for the sake of doing so. But we always want to tie it back to the outcome that we want to produce. And of course, we have often there's like moving targets and there's lots of like moving factors that go into something. But as long as we keep the positive outcome for the customer, 
front and center. The how do we get there might be changing, but the end goal is clear. So for us, like a clear mission and vision always is the first step to keep motivation up and to keep working towards that. So that even if you change, for example, from one product feature to the other that you're working on, you still know why we are doing this. And then I would also, coming back to Amy's point from earlier, always tie it back in with the voice of the customer to see what is the actual impact that we created. So to make it tangible that doing this thing right now or changing this thing to this other thing is actually creating some value. And for me, the motivation is all in the value. That might be different for other teams. Maybe you have to be a bit more numbers driven, then you can make it more measurable. Um, But understanding what the motivational factors of someone are and then showing how this is represented in your map, if it's a comprehensive one, would be would be my biggest tip. Amy, you want to add? I, th- I think you hit the nail on the head. Just keeping keeping them sort of focused on the North Star and not down in the specific details, but that and and also setting the tone that it's and you know it's evolutionary. It, it, I mean, that's that's the nature of product teams, right? Is is it like this continuous sort of flow and change? And so just t- just I think nailing the adaptability, the messaging, the communication to the teams as you're rolling it out, I think is super critical. I would say, especially as as it, I mean, it, journey mapping is such a um, uh, an ever like morphing and evolving um, uh, exercise. So the more you can communicate with the team up front, like w- or when you're rolling it out, that it you know that it is a living, breathing document. Then I think they start to get used to the the, the change, the constant change, um, and and the adaptability. Yeah. Thank you so much. I love these ideas. Uh, then we have a question from Diana. Uh, when it comes to building bridges, coordinating multiple departments can be hard due to the politics, unaligned goals and success criteria and stuff like that. Can you share the story uh, of a time when you have come across a challenge when building bridges and how you overcame it? Amy? You want me to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I think... I think all of the time. So you will not, not everyone is going to be a champion of, uh, of building a journey map for the initiatives that you want to undertake as a, as a departmental or functional leader. Um, but what I would say is the, the best way to sort of build a bridge is to build a relationship first. Um, and so keeping close ties to it, it, this, this goes a little bit back to the CX ambassador, but understanding sort of who in the organization that, that, um, uh, kind of cares about customers. Uh, and, and that may not be somebody that you know, but it may be somebody that, it's, uh, that someone from your team knows or, um, you know, so, so kind of building those, a, a bit of that cross-functional network internally um, and keeping like keeping tabs on sort of who is like very customer focused, it, depending on your organization and what communication tools you use, you can tell a lot, like if you're looking in Slack, like who's always asking like, Hey, have we heard from this customer or have we heard, you know, have we heard about this? And that's always jumping in to help those sorts of folks in your organization can be those like bridge builders or those CX ambassadors. So talking to them, building your connections, your relationships with, um, with those individuals, I think is the quickest and easiest way to build bridges. I would say the, the second, um, quickest and easiest tip, uh, is to leverage your team members. Um, because a lot of times, you know, I always have, have coached my teams. It's, um, you know, it's not the process that gets things done, it's people. And so if you have good relationships, uh, for example, with, um, uh, I'll use an example, not journey map related, but with support teams, um, usually half the stuff that gets done in support gets done because there's a relationship with the engineer that's actually working on the, the product um, or with a product manager. And so a lot of the things that sort of get pushed through um, are, are just through relationship building. Um, so I would say definitely leverage leverage the the, the grassroots folks who really like uh, want to get things done for customers to, to be those, those bridge builders and just understand who they are. And um, yeah, I think those were pro- are probably some of the bigger, the, the, the best tips I can give. It's all about the, the relationships and, um, and making sure that you do, that you're, that you're building those in the spirit of improving the customer experience and, um, and, and improving the company and the outcome. Thank you so much. Sally, you want to add something? <laughs> I like the granular level. Um, maybe obviously what it's easiest and I don't know how practical it is, but maybe it's a takeaway. Also take it to the biggest level that's possible. So while those individual connections, IC to IC, 
uh, work wonders. If you have a leader in place or even your functional leader that is a strong believer of customer centricity, that can change so many things. Because if we lead by example, they, for example, if your CEO, your CEO, whomever incorporates your journey input insights into a QBR, into a kickoff, that gives it a different type of importance to people. And they see that it's not just there for the sake of being there, but it's really there because people look at it. And uh, we always coach our, our customers as well to always think all the other sites and or, or in every conversation, the other person opposite to you also wants to be promoted, also wants to look good, also wants to advance their careers. So building on that and incentivizing people to use things can be a game changer, but I know CEOs and CEOs and stuff are hard to access. Uh, if, I, if I do so, I'd probably go back to the slides on, uh, on the numbers that Amy shared and go in and calculate, hey, if we could increase or if yeah, if we could increase our NPS by three percent, whatever that might be, that I wanted would to get up later. Ten percent. That would oh, uh, sorry about we, that. But, oh we have someone on. No but worries. Sorry, um if we increase NPS and we increase car decrease costs by ten percent, you could calculate what that means in dollars and then go your, to your meters and that probably has a different lever down with that number behind it. Thank you. And we have two very interesting questions here in the chat. Uh, how do you approach multi-service based business into a journey map? Having multiple services or multiple personas in multiple markets seems like a lot of variance and then dilutes ownership or relevance with teams. Yeah, I think it depends on the, the structure. So, um, it, and, and to Sally's point earlier, building the, the more you can build a unified map to start with, so that it doesn't, you know, you don't have this delusion and it's it, and it's so complex that it never gets implemented. You know, I would use the KISS principle, keep it simple um, and uh, keep it simple, Sally. There we go. That's our new <laughs> KISS principle. <laughs> um, but but ultimately, like having something that you can that's actually actionable and that people will use, I, I think that's that's probably your best bet. Once it becomes too complex, it's not something that can be implemented um, and it doesn't start simple. I think that's when people start to abandon ship. They're just like, oh, it's too much. But if you, have, if, again, if you focus on the 80-20 rule, you know, you try to, you try to hit 80% of the, um, of those playbooks of, across the journey and really like the things that matter the most to help to deliver whatever it is you're trying to deliver with the journey map, whether that be revenue or an improved service, improved experience, what have you. Um, but figuring out like what's the purpose of the map and then how do you actually map the, the, the journey based on the 80% of things that are really going to move the needle and just keep it simple and then build from there. You know, once people get used to that, again, you, you get to think a journey map is all about transformational change. And people, as we know, love change. I mean, <laughs> just kidding. There, <laughs> people are usually like very adverse to change. This is just our human nature. And so the, you know, if you keep it simple, you implement that change, you roll that change out through the organization, people get used to it. Again, that comes with a lot of education then you take the next step, you know, and you just sort of like, uh, what, what is that saying? How do you, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> one, one small bite at a time. Um, so just step by step, you know, one, one small step followed by the next small, small step followed by the next small step. And, um, and that's, I think, you know, journey mapping is not like an all in one, we do it at one time. And then there's just this grand rollout. I think it's keep it simple and then add the next thing. And then the next thing, once people have adopted it. Thank you, Amy. And I You're love welcome. loved how you mentioned uh, that uh, you need to see the goal why you map the uh, why you do actually the journey map because this is what we actually constantly say to you, Expressa, uh, you are not building the map just for the sake of building it. There must be a goal why you do that. And yeah. having a goal in mind is actually a great way to understand what you need to include in the map. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but like begin I, I with the it. end in mind, Stephen Covey. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great point here. <laughs> Reading tip on top. <laughs> Absolutely. And then uh, the last question for today is from Hugo. Uh, which positions in the company do you recommend to assign as journey champions? Uh, in my experience, this job best fits with product and channel owners. But would you appreciate? You, uh, but I would appreciate your opinion and experience. 
I'd say the more the better. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the I agree. Get on board, the better. Don't be picky about the roles or the titles. Um, I think it's worth looking a bit into having a variety and make it as diverse as possible. So having a few individual people in there, a few team leads, a few regional leads or or some sort of overview and directors. Um, on the more level we get, the better. And as Amy said earlier, like things get done when people have relationships. Um, and the more kind of like diversity you cover in your ambassador program, the better. Obviously, product manager, channel managers, they are very well trained in communicating and getting the word out. So they might be, again, great role models as ambassadors, but I definitely spread it out to everybody that wants to be involved. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, I think the key point, make sure you've got an ambassador for each functional area. And I mean, even finance, you would be amazed at like, like what dissatisfiers come out of like billing and you you name it. So <laughs> I think Veronica last, but it is. It's like one of those things that is is in many in many companies, you know, not a, not an easy thing. So, um, so get the, you know get ambassadors across each of those functional areas as much as you can because it, again, it's just tying that like connective tissue of the organization together and unifying them. And so, um, yeah, that would be my piece of uh, my little addition there. <laughs> 